Part 1. Faith. The aim of this book is to carefully bring out some of the more important principles of spiritual growth to help the reader build on a sound biblical foundation in Christ. He can honour no other. The Holy Spirit had Paul write to each of us, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 And the recommendation is certainly not out of order at the inception of this series of studies. First of all, we must remind ourselves that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 Moreover, and this is all important, faith must be based solely on scriptural facts. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 17 Unless our faith is established on facts, it is no more than conjecture, superstition, speculation or presumption. Hebrews 11 verse 1 leaves no question regarding this. We read that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, standing on the facts of the word of God, substantiates and gives evidence of things not seen. And everyone knows that evidence must be founded on facts. All of us started on this principle when we were born again. Our belief stood directly on the eternal fact of the redeeming death and resurrection of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 This is the faith by which we begin. And this is the faith by which we are to stand, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And this is the faith by which we are to walk, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. And this is the faith by which we are to live, Galatians 2, verse 20. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Colossians 2 verse 6 Since true faith is anchored on scriptural facts, we are certainly not to be influenced by impressions. George Muller said that impressions have neither one thing nor the other to do with faith. Faith has to do with the word of God. It is not impressions, strong or weak, which will make the difference. We have to do with the written word, and not ourselves, nor our impressions. Also, probabilities are a big temptation when it comes to exercising faith. Too often the attitude is, it doesn't seem probable that he will ever be saved. The way that things are going, I wonder if the Lord really loves me. But Muller wrote, Many people are willing to believe regarding things that seem to be probable to them. But faith has nothing to do with probabilities. The providence of faith begins where probabilities cease and sight and sense fail. Appearances are not to be taken into account. The question is whether God has spoken in his word. Alexander Hay adds to this by saying that Faith must be based upon certainty. There must be a definite knowledge of God's purpose and his will. Without that, there can be no true faith. For faith is not a force that we exercise or a striving to believe that something shall be, thinking that if we believe hard enough, it will come to pass. That may be positive thinking, but it is certainly not biblical faith. Evan Hopkins writes that faith needs facts to rest upon. Presumption can take fancy instead of fact. God in his word reveals to us the facts with which the faith has to deal. It is on this fact that J.B. Stoney can say the following. Real faith is always increased by opposition, 
while false confidence is damaged and discouraged by it. There can be no steadfastness apart from immovable facts. Peter's burden was this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.7 once we begin to reckon or count on facts, our Father begins to build up in us the faith. From his profoundly simple trust in God, Muller was able to say that God delights to increase the faith of his children and continues that we ought instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise for patience, to be willing to take them from God's hand as a means. I say, and I say it deliberately, trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. On this same subject, James McConkie writes, Faith is dependence upon God, and this God dependence only begins when self-dependence ends. And self-dependence only comes to its end with some of us when sorrow, suffering, affliction, broken plans and hopes bring us to the place of self-helplessness and defeat. And only then do we find that we have learned the lesson of faith to find our tiny craft of life rushing onward to a blessed victory of life and power and service undreamed of in the days of our fleshly strength and self-reliance. J.B. Stoney agrees by saying it is a great thing to learn faith. That is simple dependence upon God. It will comfort you to be assured that the Lord is teaching you dependence upon himself. And it is very remarkable that faith is necessary in everything. The just shall live by faith, not only in your circumstances, but in everything. I believe the Lord allows many things to happen on purpose, to make us feel our need of him. The more you find him in your sorrows or wants, the more you will be attached to him and drawn away from this place where the sorrows are, to him in the place where he is. Set your affections upon the things above. Colossians 3 verse 2 Actually, we cannot trust anyone further than we know him. So we must not only learn the facts involved, but must always intimately come to know the one who presents and upholds them. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verses 2 to 4 Part 2. Time It seems that most believers have difficulty in realising and facing up to the inexorable fact that God does not hurry in his development of our Christian life. He is working from and for eternity. So many feel that they're not making progress unless they are swiftly and constantly forging ahead. Now it is true that the new convert often begins and continues for some time at a fast rate, but this will not continue if there is to be healthy growth and ultimate maturity. God himself 
will modify the pace. This is important to see, since in most instances, when seeming declension begins to set in, it is not, as so many think, a matter of backsliding. John Darby makes it plain that it is God's way to set people aside after their first start, that self-confidence may die down. Thus, Moses was 40 years. On his first start, he had to run away. Paul was three years also after his first testimony. Not that God did not approve the first earnest testimony. We must get to know ourselves and that we have no strength. Thus we must learn, and then leaning on the Lord, we can with more maturity and more experientially deal with the souls. Since the Christian life matures and becomes fruitful by the principles of growth, as seen in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, rather than by struggles and experiences, much time is involved. Unless we acquiesce to this, there is bound to be constant frustration, to say nothing of resistance to our Father's development process for us. A. H. Strong illustrates it for us like this. He says a student asks the president of his school whether he couldn't take a shorter course than the one prescribed. Oh yes, replied the president but then it depends upon what you want to be. When God wants to make an oak, he takes a hundred years, but when he wants to make a squash, it takes six months. Strong also wisely points out to us that growth is not a uniform thing in the tree or in the Christian. In some single months, there is more growth than in all the year besides. During the rest of the year, however, there is solidification, without which the green timbers would be useless. The period of rapid growth, when woody fibre is actually deposited between the bark and the trunk, occupies but four to six weeks in May, June and July. Let's settle it once and for all. There are no shortcuts to reality. To growth. A meteor is on a shortcut as it proceeds to burn out. Oh, but not a star. With its steady light, so often depended on by navigators. Unless the time factor is acknowledged from the heart, there's always danger of turning to the false enticement of shortcuts via the means of experiences and blessings where one becomes pathetically enmeshed in the vortex of ever-changing feelings, adrift from the moorings of scriptural facts. Concerning this subject, George Goodman writes the following. Some have been betrayed into professing perfection or full deliverance because at the time they speak they are happy and confident in the Lord. They forget that it is not a present experience that ensures fruit unto maturity, but a patient continuance in well-doing. To taste of the grace of God is one thing. To be established in it and manifest its character, habit and regular life is another. Experiences and blessings, though real and gracious visitations from the Lord, are not sufficient to rest upon, nor should they lead us to glory in ourselves, as if we had a store of grace for time to come, or were yet at the end of the conflict. No, fruit ripens slowly. Days of sunshine and days of storm each add their share. Blessing will succeed blessing, and storm will follow storm before the fruit is full grown or comes to maturity. In that the husbandman's method for true spiritual growth involves pain as well as joy, suffering as well as happiness, failure as well as success, 
inactivity as well as service, death as well as life. The temptation to shortcut is especially strong unless we see the value of and submit to the necessity of the time element. In simple trust, resting in his hands, being confident of this thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 verse 6 Oh, and dear friends, it will take that long. But since God is working for eternity, why should we be concerned about the time involved? Graham Scroggy affirmed the following. He wrote, Spiritual renewal is a gradual process. All growth is progressive. And the finer the organism, the longer the process. It is from measure to measure, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold. It is from stage to stage. First the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear. It is from day to day. How varied these are. There are great days, days of decisive battles, days of crises in spiritual history, days of triumph in Christian service, days of the right hand of God upon us. But there are also idle days, days apparently useless, when even prayer and holy service seem a burden. Are we in any sense renewed in these days? Yes, for any experience which makes us more aware of our need of God must contribute to spiritual progress, unless we deny the Lord who bought us. We might consider some familiar names of believers whom God obviously brought to maturity and used for his glory. Names such as Pearson, Chapman, Towler, Moody and Goforth, Muller. Taylor, Watt, Trumbull, Mayo and Murray, Havergal, Guyon, Maybe, Gordon, Hyde, Mantle, McShane, McConkie, Deck, Paxton, Stoney, Sapphire, Carmichael and Hopkins. Oh, the average for these was 15 years after they entered their life work and before they began to know the Lord Jesus as their life and ceased trying to work for him and began allowing him to be their all in all and to do his work through them. This is not to discourage us in any way, but to help us to settle down with our sights on eternity by faith, apprehending that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 12, verses 12 and 14. Certainly this is not to discount a spirit-fostered experience, blessing or even a crisis. But it is to be remembered that these simply contribute to the overall, to the all-important process it takes time to get to know oneself. It takes time and eternity to get to know the infinite Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day to put the hand to the plough and irrevocably set the heart on his goal for us that we may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3 verse 10 So often in battle, says Austin Sparks, we go to the Lord and pray and plead and appeal for victory, for ascendancy, for mastery over the forces of evil and death. And our thought is that in some way the Lord is going to come in with a mighty exercise of power 
and put us into a place of victory and spiritual ascendancy, as in an act. We must have this mentality corrected. What the Lord does is to enlarge us to possess. He puts us through some exercise, through some experience, takes us by some way that means our spiritual expansion, an exercise of spirituality, so we occupy the larger place spontaneously. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. Little by little I will drive them out before thee until thou be increased. Exodus 23 verse 29 to 30. One day in the House of Commons, British Prime Minister Disraeli made a brilliant speech on the spur of the moment. That night a friend said to him, Oh, I must tell you how much I enjoyed your extemporaneous talk. It has been on my mind all day. Madam, confessed Disraeli, that extemporaneous talk has been on my mind for 20 years. Part 3. Acceptance There are two questions that every believer must settle as soon as possible. The one is, does God fully accept me? And if so, on what basis does he do so? This is crucial. What devastation often permeates the life of one, young or old, rich or poor, saved or unsaved, who is not sure of being accepted even on a human level. And yet so many believers, whether strugglers or vegetators, move through life without this precious fact to rest upon and build on. In Ephesians 1 verses 5 and 6 we read, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Every believer is accepted by the Father in Christ. Being justified by faith, we read in Romans 5, verse 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace is God's towards us, through his beloved Son. On this, our peace is based. God is able to be at peace with us through our Lord Jesus Christ, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1 verse 20. And we must never forget that his peace is founded solely on the work of the cross totally apart from anything whatsoever in us or from us, since God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. Our faith becomes a fixed attitude once it begins to rest in this wonderful fact. This is the steadying influence most believers are in need of today. A century ago, J.B. Stoney wrote the following. He said, The blessed God never alters nor diverges from the acceptance in which he has retrieved us because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, alas, we diverge from the state in which God can ever be towards us as recorded in Romans 5, 1 to 11. Many suppose that because they're conscious of sins, that hence they must renew their acceptance with God. The truth is that God has not altered. His eye rests on the work accomplished by Christ for the believer. When you are not walking in the spirit, you're in the flesh. 
you have turned to the old man which was crucified on the cross. See Romans 6 verse 6. You have to be restored to fellowship and when you are you find your acceptance with God unchanged and unchangeable. When sins are introduced there is a fear that God has changed. He hasn't changed but you have. You are not walking in the spirit, but in the flesh. You have to judge yourself in order to be restored. We read in Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But if your sins are not met there, where can they be met? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18. Now where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. God has effected the reconciliation. He always remains true to it. Oh, alas, we diverge from it. And the tendency is to suppose that the blessed God has altered towards us. He certainly will judge the flesh if we do not but he never departs from the love which he has expressed to the prodigal. And we find that when the cloud, which walking in the flesh produced, has passed away, his love, blessed be his name, his love has never changed. God's basis must be our basis for acceptance. There is none other. We are accepted in the beloved. Our father is fully satisfied with his beloved son on our behalf and there is no reason for us not to be. Our satisfaction can only spring from and rest in his satisfaction. It is from God to us, not from us to God. Jay and Darby was very clear on this. He said, when the Holy Spirit reasons with man, he does not reason from what man is for God, but from what God is to man. Souls reason from what they are in themselves as to whether God can accept them. He cannot accept you thus. You are looking for righteousness in yourself on a ground of acceptance with him. You cannot get peace while reasoning this way round. The Holy Spirit always reasons down from what God is, and this produces a total change in my soul. It is not that I abhor my sins. Indeed, I may well have been walking very well. But it is I abhor myself. This is how the Holy Spirit reasons. He shows us what we are. And that is one reason why he often seems to be very hard and doesn't give peace to our soul, as we are not relieved until we experientially, from our hearts, acknowledge what we are. Until the soul comes to that point, he does not give it peace. He could not. It would not be healing the wound slightly. The soul has to go on until it finds there is nothing to rest on but the abstract goodness of God. And then, as we read in Romans 8.31, then if God be for us, who can be against us? Sad today though, most believers actually reason just the opposite, from themselves to God. When all is going well and God seems to be blessing, then it is, that they feel he loves and accepts them. But when they are stumbling and everything seems dry and hard, then they feel that he doesn't love and accept them. How can this be? There is nothing about us to commend us to God, our acceptance being in Christ, plus the fact that most of our true spiritual development comes through the dry and the hard times. Thank God he has accepted us in his son. And upon this fact, we must rest our faith. As in justification, 
Our acceptance is by grace alone. In his classic Romans verse by verse, William Newell presents some penetrating thoughts regarding this grace. He writes, There being no cause in the creature why grace should be shown, the creature must be brought off from trying to give cause to God for his care. He has been accepted in Christ, who is his standing. He is not on probation. As to his life past, it does not exist before God. He died at the cross, and Christ is his life. Grace, once bestowed, is not withdrawn. For God knew all the human exigences, the requirements beforehand. His action was independent of them, not dependent upon them. Newell continues with what we need regarding this grace. We need to believe and to consent to be loved while unworthy. This is the great secret. To refuse to make resolutions and vows, for that is to trust in the flesh. To expect to be blessed, though realising more and more our lack of worth. To rely on God's chastening hand, his child training as a mark of his kindness. To hope to be better, or hence acceptable, is to fail to see yourself in Christ only. To be disappointed with yourself is to have believed in yourself. And to be discouraged is unbelief as to God's purpose and plan of blessing for you. To be proud is to be blind, for we have no standing before God in ourselves. The lack of divine blessing, therefore, comes from unbelief and not from failure of devotion. To preach devotion first and blessing second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. The law made man's blessing dependent on devotion. Grace confers undeserved, unconditional blessing. Our devotion may follow, but does not always do so in proper measure. Have we been afraid to really believe God? Have some even been afraid to allow others to really believe him? We must never forget that God's ways are not always man's ways. To some men, constant peril is the only spur to action, and many religions and psychologies are dependent on fear to keep their disciples in line. Fear, too, has a place in Christianity, but God has higher and more effective motivations than fear, and one of these is love. Often fear after a while produces only numbness, but love thrives on love. To promise a man the certainty of his destiny may seem, on the human level, like playing with fire, but this leaves God out of the picture. Those who have the deepest appreciation of grace do not continue in sin. Moreover, fear produces the obedience of slaves but love, oh, love engenders the obedience of sons. We read in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare to the battle? Until the Christian is absolutely and scripturally sure in his standing, he is not going to do much standing. But in Ephesians 6, we're told to stand therefore. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your heart and establish you in every good work and word. 2 Thessalonians 2, 
16 and 17. Part 4. Purpose. How wonderful and encouraging it is to know that our Heavenly Father has made it crystal clear in his word exactly what his purpose is for each one of us. Now is the time, in these next few moments, to make sure on the authority of his eternal word as to his purpose for your personal life. In Genesis 1.26 we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image. The first Adam, the head of the human race, was made in God's image in the realm of personality, intellect, emotions, will and so on. So that there could be communion and fellowship and cooperation between them. With God sovereign and man subject subject to God's will, which is perfect freedom. But we know that Adam was beguiled into choosing his own way in preference to God's way, relying on himself only and loving just himself. As a result, he immediately became self-centred instead of God-centred, dead to God who is the source of all life dead in trespasses and sins. In this condition, Adam begat a son in his own image, after his image, his fallen image, Genesis 5 verse 3. Thus, he brought forth a sinful, ungodly, self-centred race, a race that was born dead in trespasses and sins. See Ephesians 2 verse 1. We read in Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, that God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Here is the image of God back on the earth, this time in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's last Adam. See 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 45 and 47. Our natural birth made us members of a fallen, sinful first Adam race. Our transition from the old, sinful race to the new godly race is known as the new birth, being born again. When we were born again through repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in Acts 20, 21. When we were born again, we were born into him. He became our life. Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4. We read in Romans eleven twenty four, 24. Thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam's disobedience, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that's Christ, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, Romans 5 verse 19. Our Heavenly Father is still carrying out his purpose of making man in his image. Although his original purpose is the same, he is not using the original man to bring it about. All is now centred in the Lord. All is centred in the last Adam, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Being born into him through faith, we become partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. And as the Lord Jesus is allowed to express himself through our personality, this poor, sin-sick world will see Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. In 1 Corinthians 15.49, Paul gives us the heartening promise that as we have borne the image of the earthly, that's Adam, 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, that's Christ. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8, 28 and 29. Here is the good for which God is working all things together. His original purpose of making us in his image, which is centred and expressed in his Son, Christ, who is our life. Paul's determination for each of his converts was, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Galatians 4.19 The open secret of healthy spiritual growth is to know and settle down on this fact as it is set forth in Romans 8.28 and 29. When we see that all things are working together to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus, we will not be frustrated and upset when some of these things are hard and difficult to understand and often contain an element of death. We will be able to rest in our Lord Jesus and say to our Father, Thy will be done. And our constant attitude of faith will be, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13 verse 15 This is our matriculation to spiritual maturity. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 It is one thing to know what God's purpose is for our life, and it is another to know something of the how as to entering into it all right here and now. One of God's most effective means in the process is failure. So many believers are simply frantic over the fact of failure in their lives. And they will go to all lengths to hide their failure, to ignore it or to rationalise about it. And all the time they are resisting the main instrument in the Father's hand for conforming us to the likeness of his Son. Failure where self is concerned in our Christian life and service is allowed and often engineered by God in order to turn us completely from ourselves to his source for our lives. Christ Jesus, who never fails, Oh, rejoice, dear friend, in your need and hunger of heart. For God says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, verse 6. As we, in our abject need, consistently and lovingly look on our Lord Jesus revealed to us in the Word, the Holy Spirit will quietly and effortlessly change the centre and the source of our lives from self to Christ. Hence for each of us it will be not I, but Christ. God has a natural law in force to the effect that we are conformed to that on which we centre our interest and love. Hawthorne brought out this fact in his book The Great Stone Face. Then, too, think of Germany, some years ago, full of little Hitlers, all because of fanatical devotion to a second-rate paper hanger. Here in our country, comic books, radio, TV and movies have all contributed in giving us a rising generation of young policemen, cowboys, gangsters and so on. And what of the believer? If we are attracted to this present evil world, we become increasingly worldly. If we pamper and live for self, we become more and more self-centred. But when we look to Jesus Christ, 
we become more and more like him. Norman Doughty writes, If I am to be like him, then God in his grace must do it. And the sooner I come to recognise it, the sooner I will be delivered from another form of bondage. Throw down every endeavour and say, I cannot do it. The more I try, the further I get away from his likeness. What shall I do? Ah, says the Holy Spirit, you cannot do it. Just withdraw. Come out of it. You have been in the arena. You have been endeavouring. You are a failure. Come out and sit down. And as you sit there, behold him. Look at him. Don't try to be like him. Just look at him. Just be occupied with him. Forget about trying to be like him. Instead of letting that fill your mind and heart, let him fill it. Just behold him. Look upon him through the word. Come to the word for one purpose, and that is to meet with the Lord. Not to get your mind crammed full of things about the sacred word, but come to it to meet the Lord. Make it to be a medium, not a Bible scholarship, but a fellowship with Christ. Behold the Lord. Tia Stegen wrote the following. Thou sayest, fit me, fashion me for thee, stretch forth thine empty hands, and be thou still. O restless soul, thou dost but hinder me, by valiant purpose and by steadfast will. Behold the summer flowers beneath the sun, in stillness his great glory they behold. And sweetly thus his mighty word is done, And resting in his gladness they unfold. So are the sweetness and the joy divine, Thine, O beloved, and the work is mine. We read in Philippians 2 verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you, Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And what is his good pleasure that he is performing in us? He is working everything together for this one purpose, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11. This is life. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1 21. This is service. And there were certain Greeks saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. John 12, 20 and 21. 